Hello, everybody. On behalf of the York Hospital Recovery Center, I'd like to welcome you to today's Zoom webinar, Treatment and Recovery from Substance Use Disorders, Reducing Stigma and Improving Community Understanding. Our presenters this afternoon are Sally Mananen, Prevention Specialist and Director of Community Health at York Hospital, Eric Harum, the Director of the York Hospital Recovery Center, Dr. Christine Monroe, Medication Assisted Treatment Director at the York Hospital Recovery Center and also Primary Care Provider, Susie McKenna, Social Worker and Certified Recovery Coach with the Portland Community Recovery Center and York Hospital, and Lacey Bailey, an Optin Options Clinician for York County with Sweetser and a Certified Alcohol and Drug Counselor and Recovery Coach as well. Sally will start off with a quick overview about the importance of prevention, followed by Eric and Dr. Monroe, who will address ways to improve understanding and reduce stigma associated with treatment and recovery from substance use disorders. We'll then hear from Susie McKenna, who will talk about recovery coaching and stigma reduction in peer-to-peer -peer settings. And finally, we'll learn how to identify the signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose and see firsthand how to administer, administer Narcan from Lacey Bailey. We will also be asking polling questions at two different times during the webinar, and we thank you in advance for answering those questions when they appear on your screen. Before we get started, we have a few quick housekeeping notes. Our presenters will speak for a combined total of about 50 minutes, followed by a Q&A session, question and answers at the end. Unlike a traditional Zoom where you're able to see everybody's faces throughout the meeting, during this webinar, you will only see our presenters' faces along with their slides. As participants, your audio has been muted. So if you do have a question, you can type it into the Q&A button located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please don't use the chat or raise hand icons as those will not be monitored during the presentation. And you are welcome to type your questions in at any time during the presentation. We do not have to wait until the end. If you have a question that has not been answered during our time together, please feel free to email us at info at yourhospital.com and we'll be happy to send a reply after this meeting ends. And we did just want to remind you too, that if you would like to uh, receive a free package of Narcan for your participation in this webinar, please send us your street mailing address. You can send that street mailing address to info at yourhospital.com as well. And we'll get that out to you either this week or next. And lastly, the webinar is being recorded and will be available to you and everyone in the community next week on the York Hospital YouTube channel. So once again, we'd like to thank you very much for tuning in today and spending this time with York Hospital. We hope you find the information helpful and we're pleased to go ahead and get started as we turn the program over to Sally Mananen. Thanks, Hillary. Thanks for those of you who are here today. I really appreciate being um, included. Um, and I just want to talk extremely briefly about the importance of prevention. If you want to know more, you can go to our website, ctbh.org, um, or you can join us at any of our um, regular monthly meetings. So if you could uh, move the slide, Kim, that'd be great. Um, so we're, we're here uh, mainly to talk about reducing stigma and treatment and recovery but I just wanna remind everyone where prevention falls um, in the continuum of care. This is a model that's used nationally and um, locally and at the state level. And so you can see how prevention really takes up quite a bit of the continuum of care up until really intervention. Uh, promotion is also something that um, occurs as part of prevention and as part of treatment and recovery promoting wellness, pr promoting health, uh, promoting good mental health, et cetera. Um, when you hear Susie and other folks talk about resources needed for good uh, recovery care, um, they will probably sound familiar to you because they will sound like many of the things we do to prevent young people from starting in the first place, like being connected to positive adults, being connected in their community, giving back to their community, um, uh, learning new ways to reduce stress, et cetera. Um, so if you could change the slide, Kim, that'd be great. So um, substance use prevention is effective. Um, there's at least 40 years of research on this. Um, it's, a, it's an actual science. Um, it uses data. It, it uses the concepts of collaboration, planning data, and proven strategies that have been evaluated. Um, all put together in a comprehensive way in, in families and schools, communities, and among the youth themselves. 
Um, and sometimes this looks like evidence-based curriculum in the schools or in the communities, restricting youth and illegal access um, to drugs, um, alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana, supporting youth who have extra risks like family history of use, trauma, depression, anxiety, learning, and behavioral disabilities, or marginalized by their LGBTQ plus status, which is something that's a whole topic in itself. And, and they're one of the populations that we work with quite a bit. And then it's all about creating and sustaining healthy environments that promote health and not normalize use. And our society already normalizes use. So we need to do our best to not normalize it at the local level. The data that you see pictured there is data that I've collected um, from state and local school surveys. So this just shows you from 2009, which was a year after, two years after I started here until the most current survey, you can see quite a decrease in um, alcohol, marijuana, and uh, prescription misuse by our ninth through 12th graders. So that's one piece of data that shows substance use prevention is effective. Next slide. Um, and substance use prevention is economical. Um, treatment is wonderful, um, but I think even the treatment folks on the call would say treatment is uh, pretty, uh, it, it's, it's not as economical as prevention. So when we think about saving money and when we're talking to folks who care perhaps more about money than they should, then we really need to focus on the fact that for every dollar invested in an evidence-based substance use prevention strategy or program or activity, there's um, a savings of up to $10 um, in areas such as treatment, overall healthcare and criminal justice costs. Um, so this is really important and it's a, a piece that's often forgotten. Next slide. Um, substance use prevention is relatively easy. Um, anyone can do it. Um, helping youth feel like they matter um, will make them 65% less likely to consider suicide. Um, it will make them 57% less likely to report depression. It will make them 24% less likely to use any substances. And that's from our own local data here in Maine from 2019. Um, so we do a lot around helping youth feel like they matter in their community. Um, and uh, anyone can involve youth in positive connecting activities like advo advocacy, um, volunteerism, giving back in their town, school, and home. Uh, mentoring youth is another activity that's really important for substance use prevention. Another thing that anyone can do is not to downplay the harms of drug use for the adolescent brain and body. That includes marijuana, which I don't think we do a good enough job at as adults. We can create and support healthy alternatives in our communities and promote them to youth and encourage them to be used. And as parents and other caregivers, we can monitor our children and be role models. And next slide. And substance use prevention is vital. Um, it's really about not only reducing use, but when you think about it, prevention is what helps reduce stigma. Um, when we do good prevention, we are preventing, um, we are doing it in a universal method. We're making sure that no young people get involved in drugs. So we don't stigmatize the use of, of the people that use drugs or, or the drug use itself, we're simply promoting health at a very young age. Um, adults in recovery or with a family history um, really need to be empowered to speak to their children. They have a really important role to play in um, prevention. And, and I want everyone to remember, and I think the folks who are in recovery can attest to this, people who need treatment um, most likely did not start with opioids or fentanyl-laced pills. They started with what they could get access to easily. That was probably alcohol or marijuana. Um, most people who need treatment started their use in adolescence. So we need to remember all of these pieces. Treatment and recovery is very important, reducing stigma everywhere along the way. Um, but we need to remember the importance of prevention. 
I put up there um, a really great website for any adult who cares about prevention, treatment, or recovery, or getting help, um, drugfree.org. And I just copied out a little piece on um, parenting toward uh, recovery and how parents can help a child who is already using, which so many of our parents ask for help with. But don't forget um, the power of prevention. And um, I, uh, I'm glad I was able to speak for a few minutes here. I have to leave because I'm on another Zoom, um, a national Zoom, um, talking about the importance of prevention there as well with a bunch of other folks. So thank you for letting me be here for a few minutes. And sorry, I will miss the rest of the presentation. Thank Bye you, Sally. That. Thank you. And now I believe we'll have our first polling questions. So now if you could just respond to those questions that are on your screen, we'll give you a moment to do that. Okay, well, I think then we will Okay, we'll give you another 25 seconds to fill those polls, and then we will turn the program back over to Eric. Okay, thank you for, for completing those questions. And now, Eric, you are welcome to take it away. Sure, thanks very much, Hillary, and I appreciate everyone's attendance today and taking the time to fill out the polling questions. Hopefully, uh, over the course of our time this afternoon, um, there will be some uh, insights and new learnings, and um, maybe we'll be able to see that reflected when we do our polling questions at the end. So we're going to really focus in on stigma reduction around substance use disorders. Uh, as Sally mentioned in her presentation about prevention, um, the relationship between prevention and treatment, if we sort of think about and define prevention services, classically there's primary prevention and secondary prevention, which is uh, specifically what Sally Manon was discussing in her previous slides. And then there's tertiary prevention, which is where folks are moving into the world of, of treatment services. Um, there is a noted um, chronic condition present. Here we're talking about substance use disorders and in uh, tertiary prevention treatment, uh, we're looking to greatly minimize the consequences of that chronic condition as well as stop. Uh, the progression of that from getting worse. Um, so really, uh, we're going to back up and look at stigma and specifically stigma around the different types of evidence-based treatments that are available. Let's look at the next slide. So when we think about substance use disorder treatment, um, what, we're, what we're looking at here is, is kind of, I think, the, the images that are mostly evoked in the general public, right? Folks who don't work in the treatment industry like those of us here on the panel. Um, and what we know from this, and th these are all sort of very popular Hollywood movies from the 90s, maybe the late 80s, you know, that treatment happens away from your home, that treatment ought to be a 28 day residential stay. Um, Treatment is available for those who can afford it. Uh, words like clean and sober describe the desired outcome. 
And if people need treatment, they can, in fact, get it. Uh, these are some of the common perceptions. Okay, and so let's look at the next slide. And, and when we think about illicit substance use disorder or, or problems that don't involve alcohol, but, but drug use, um, the perception starts to shift a little bit. And you, we, we have much more of a perception around uh, criminality, hopelessness, um, that you know, maybe these are folks that we ought to avoid, uh, that they need to go away to some place like a 28 day program. Um, and that these problems, these substances have to be treated somehow differently uh, than the, the way that we sort of idealize the types of treatment for primarily alcohol use disorder. Um, so next slide. And, and it's important for, for, I think, everyone to know that one size does not fit all, meaning uh, these, these perceptions of the, the go away from home, nice 28 day programs or month long programs uh, in, in kind of a rural setting um, are better. And the reality is, is that there's very clear evidence that people can in fact do recover um, and do so at higher rates when they can access treatment in their home communities. Uh, staying involved with family, employment and recovery supports are, are found uh, to improve success. Um, recovery in the culture of one's own community reduces stigma and shame, right? Which is kind of the point of what we're here to talk about. Uh, and the type of treatment one gets really should be based on their medical necessity and standard patient placement criteria, right? Versus our perceptions of what is available or what's needed. Next slide. So we wouldn't be um, doing our job well if we didn't name and talk about community and family norms about substance use. Uh, and again, this is sort of right in the middle of the world of prevention, primary and secondary prevention that Sally was talking about. And a big part of choose to be healthy and community and public health is, is really looking at what the community and family norms around substance use are. Um, this is from a slide deck that I did a number, uh, about a year ago uh, into COVID, where we were really looking at what was happening with substance use around our state during the isolation and some of the social distancing and, and the, the going home for school and, and all of that. Uh, and what we found, of course, was that the, the rates, particularly of drinking, went, went really much, much higher during COVID. Um, millions and millions and millions of dollars in sales. Um, and there was a lot of humor that uh, was reflected back to us in media, which you see here, that, you know, was supposed to be funny, but ultimately um, these reflect changing norms in our community. The, the uh, you know, maybe a, a month into the pandemic, uh, this is a Saturday Night Live skit called Let Kids Drink. That's about a four minute long music medley um, at the frustration that parents were beginning to experience with at home school and uh, the social distancing that was happening in their kids' lives. Um, and in fact, the, the uh, point here is that uh, community norms have a really big role in how we perceive substance use, substance use disorders, and the stigmatizing language that we use in association with it. Next slide. So stigma about substance use disorders and seeking help. Stigma refers to negative stereotypes an attribute, behavior, or condition that is considered socially discrediting. Uh, discrimination is the behavior of society that results from these negative stereotypes. Um, and the above represents a social baseline reflecting attitudes and beliefs about substance use disorders and those who struggle with them. Uh, during COVID particularly, this dynamic got even worse uh, for individuals who were struggling with a condition such as a substance use disorder that is heavily perceived as a, a, a self-made problem, right? The, the idea then of asking for help uh, in that 
sort of social dynamic made it even more difficult, right? We were supposed to be leaving our caregivers and first responders alone to take care of people who were most sick and most sick uh, or at risk with COVID. Um, and so what we saw was the, uh, the reaching out for help went down at the same time the prevalence of use went up. Uh, which is, of course, a, a terrible recipe. So not only did folks who had this problem uh, struggle with getting help, um, but they had to do so when they, this was a time when everyone was supposed to be, you know, quote, making do and mending at home. Uh, next slide. So language is a really big deal. Right. The, the words we use to describe things are far more powerful than often we know. Um, and so rather than going through all of these here, I, I want folks to be able to access this uh, in the future. So think about the language that each of us uses. So instead of saying that person is an addict, you know, we, what we might do, which is far less stigmatizing, is try this is a person with a substance use disorder. Um, they're, instead of saying they're addicted to um, crack cocaine, you know, they have a cocaine use disorder, a stimulant use disorder. Um, alcoholic, again, a person with an alcohol use disorder or a serious alcohol use disorder. Um, and let's look at the next slide. We don't say clean and dirty anymore. Uh, that's a huge one and one that we, uh, challenge our patients with because often our clients fall victim to using these same self-stigmatizing words. A person is not, of course, clean or dirty, uh, right? Or referencing a uh, perhaps some kind of a, a biofluid screen, a urine screen, a blood screen, a hair test, saliva test. Uh, and those things are either positive or negative. They're not uh, clean or dirty. Um, Instead of drug or substance abuser, you know, a person with a substance use disorder, a person who uses drugs. Um, and we'll, we'll look a little bit, I, I think at maybe this next slide, um, in terms of language in a clinical setting. So thinking about, you know, professionals in medicine. Uh, so in this study, they looked at 500 doctoral level clinicians and they expose them to a, a vignette, right? A, a man who's mandated to treatment using drugs and alcohol for a few years. Um, uh, he's in a program that requires abstinence and he's had two positive urine drug screens in the last month. He's waiting for an appointment with the judge to make a determination. Um, and in half of this 500 group, uh, the man at question was labeled a person with a substance use disorder. And with the other half, the man was labeled a substance abuser. And what we found when we looked at how they responded to questions about what to do, and in fact, the hope or restorative potential in this situation, those who got the case titled substance abuser were far more likely to be judgmental of the person, uh, rated their questions to that the person was much more deserving of blame and punishment, and they were much, much importantly, less likely to refer to treatment. And we saw the exact opposite when the person, the patient in this vignette was characterized as a person with a substance use disorder. Right. And so right away, you see these shifts that happen in our brain with the language we use. Right. This person has a substance use disorder. They have a condition for which there is known evidence based treatment that is proven to be effective. Or you have a substance abuser. And the word abuser is one that we use when characterizing a lot of different negative things, right? A spouse abuser, a child abuser. Um, and, and those are heavily stigmatized behaviors that don't engender a lot of empathy, right? And so uh, you get what's happening here with the power of language. Next slide. So if you or someone you love is out there and struggling with some of these problems, some of these issues, um, 
We want you to be aware of the fabric in our community that's available for help. Don't forget your primary care provider. We've done a lot of work at York Hospital across those different primary care offices to Im improve people's understanding, empathy, uh, and knowledge base about substance use, substance use disorders, and how to talk to people and how to really got to what is going to be the most helpful direction for each individual, right? Don't forget your routine care. Um, you can talk to your primary care provider, you can get help and assistance, right? Uh, or you can call directly the recovery center. Um, you might find that you need to go to the York Hospital Emergency Department and there the staff can do evaluations and treatment for withdrawal for both alcohol and opiate use disorder. There are crisis services. If you are appropriate for medications for opiate use disorder, they can get you started there and refer you back to the recovery center where we will continue your medication and treatment. Next slide. Uh, or you can call us directly at the recovery center and we offer this continuum and complement of services. Uh, these are put together in an individualized basis based on the needs of each individual client that we work with. Um, one of the things that I think is really important where we're talking here about stigma is if we can just look at the previous slide. These are general medical establishments, primary care and the emergency department that we have typically not thought of as being very welcoming or understanding of folks struggling with substance use disorders. This, again, I want to underscore here to start to dispel this community mythology, right? These are useful, uh, competent uh, locations for people to seek help, and I want to encourage you to do that. So let's go two slides forward. There we go. Also, there are a lot of different recovery groups available. Uh, these are available increasingly online in virtual capacity as well as in person, and when Susie uh, comes on next, she will go through some of these in a lot more detail. Let's look at the next slide. So substance use disorders are a window of opportunity illness. And what that means is a person's interest, willingness, and motivation to do something about it changes frequently, right? Nobody wants to exist from day to day with this kind of a chronic problem. Uh, but a person's resolve and their motivation and their willingness to do something really does sort of come and go. That's why when a person's saying, I need to do something about this, right, all of this stuff about our baggage, our issues, stigma, language really needs to get out of the way, right? It's just not going to help a person continue to walk through that initial motivation. That's why at the recovery center, when a person calls, we try to always get them in same day or next day, because we recognize that when a person says, I'm ready to do something, the most appropriate response is, yes, come on in, we know what to do. Okay, next slide. So what the stats say in general public is that the majority of Americans have been affected by a substance use disorder somehow in their life. Right. And that, again, the majority, 67 percent, believe that there is significant stigma towards people in recovery. And that, again, the majority of the general public say that attitudes and policies must change. Right. And if we ask questions of those in recovery, those with lived experience, 88 percent believe there it is very important for the American public to see that thousands and thousands get well every year. Next slide. So um, William White is a uh, researcher and advocate in the world of substance use disorders and substance use treatment and prevention and, and really sort of the, the godfather of language and recognizing that words really have power, right? Words, power can wound or heal. The right words catalyze personal transformation and offer invitations to citizenship and community service, right? The wrong words stigmatize, disempower, and disenfranchise. Next slide. So more on the power of words, right? Many times the language used in substance use disorder and mental health services can block 
recovery and in fact be dehumanizing. Reducing a person to nothing more than their difficulties is one of the most damaging and dehumanizing forms of language. It denies the existence of any facet of the person, any relevant roles or characteristics other than their diagnosis, right? You are an addict. Right, would be an example of a highly stigmatized way of describing what we're trying to get at with these slides. Right, when I say you're an addict, it offers no room for me to understand you in any other way. Okay, let's look at that bounty slide to just give us a sense of where we've been. Right, this is in fact a real poster from the Waldo County Sheriff's Department in 1970. Um, right, and so we had a huge influx of opioids in the early 70s, uh, kind of around the end of Vietnam War, and uh, this was kind of the word of mouth strategy back in the day, uh, right, is if you're a dealer, we're going to put a bounty on you, okay. Um, this is, uh, well, you know, this isn't that Long ago, many of us uh, on the Zoom were alive during this <laughs> era. Um, and it's here as an example to underscore the role of stigma and language, and also to sort of reflect on how far we've come. Waldo County Sheriff's Department is significant champion of access to substance use treatment. Uh, one of the big champions in the statewide options outreach program and um, has uh, 180 degrees from, from this historical view. Next slide. So other concepts that we really want to focus on to elevate and celebrate, right, is, is the growth that folks experience as they move through phases of recovery and empowerment over their substance use disorder. Uh, Hopes, dreams, aspirations, you know, there are lots and lots of examples of living proof that are somewhat reticent to raise their hand and say, I'm the vocal majority here, uh, because in fact of the stigma that is so prevalent in society. We want to be focusing on solutions instead of the problem. We want integrated care models, right? Um, medical and social interventions promoting real healing and remission. Next slide. So what can we do about stigma and discrimination? Most importantly, focus on our language. As humans, uh, one of the weird things is that we're very, very good at identifying implicit bias, bias and stigma in other people. And we're really not very good at seeing it in ourselves. So one of the most powerful things you can do in your sphere of influence, right, with your family, your friends, your coworkers, uh, et cetera, is make it okay to point out to each other when stigmatizing language is used, right? We, we, we sort of wanna identify for each other when we're doing it well and, and also when we're not, right? These are easy things to slip back into and since we're really bad at seeing these things in ourselves, we need the people around us to remind us. And that's okay. Next slide. So I'm going to move through these very quickly, but I wanted to be able to give everybody joining today some understanding of some of the types of treatment, some of the medical treatments that are available specifically for the treatment of opiate use disorder. There's a lot of stigma about substance use disorders. There's a lot of stigma about the types of treatment. There's a sort of belief that if maybe you're prescribed certain medications as a part of treating your substance use disorder, that you're somehow less engaged in recovery. And we wanna really dispel that myth today, okay? So when we talk about what is substance dependence, that is when the absence of a substance you find that there's been an increase in tolerance, meaning the person uses more of something than they used to to get the same effect. And when the substance isn't in their system, there can be a withdrawal syndrome. Additionally, we look for compulsive use and use despite harmful consequences, meaning in spite of the fact that bad things are happening, the person may continue to use anyway. 
right? When that dynamic exists with the tolerance, then we have the medical definition of a substance use dependence. Next slide. There's so much talk about fentanyl um, that I wanted to just give people a visual, right? And so this slide shows pictures of different types of heroin. Top left is tar heroin. Uh, and then you have two different versions of powdered form. And then on the bottom left, really, you have two dose equivalents, one of heroin and one of fentanyl. And the point there for you to take away is it takes way less fentanyl to equal the same amount of heroin. And when you look at that recipe, you can start to see how easily and dangerously a person could uh, overdose with the substitutions of fentanyl uh, over these other forms of opioids. Next slide. So one of the medications that is best researched and providing the best outcomes in the treatment of opiate use disorder is this medication called buprenorphine, or the brand name here, Suboxone. Next slide. Another medication for the treatment of opiate use disorder and the um, prevention of relapse for both opioids and alcohol is this medication called naltrexone uh, or Vivitrol. And this is a, an actual injection shot. And this medication lasts in the system for about three weeks in terms of blocking the effects of any substances that the person may relapse or inadvertently or purposefully use, uh, this medication will stop those things from having an effect. Next slide. So some basics on the neurobiology of substance use disorders or sort of how does this thing progress, right? And the stages of that are people start, uh, as Sally Manonen said, with binge use. Right, using episodically, using to points of intoxication due to lack of experience. Uh, a certain subset of individuals continue with their use beyond binge use into regular use that they begin to experience withdrawal or negative affect uh, or not feeling as well when they're not using. And sort of that third phase there is when the person becomes preoccupied, thinking constantly about the next time they're able to use and having problems and distractions with anticipating that next event. Okay, next slide. There is a huge link between substance use disorders and trauma history, right? And the, the, the very, Troubling dynamic with this is that the use of substances often lead individuals to other kinds of high-risk behaviors or high-risk relationships that can result in re-traumatization, right? Using substances to cope with trauma and finding oneself in, in fact, traumatic uh, or high-risk situations that uh, in effect make things worse. Next slide. Like other chronic illnesses, substance use disorders have very predictable relapse and remission rates. And what I want you to pay attention to here is that the relapse and remission rates of a substance use disorder are about the same as type one diabetes, hypertension and asthma, right? But the way we perceive and deal with relapses of hypertension, asthma, and diabetes is much different and much less stigmatized than the way we deal with relapse around substance use disorders. Okay, next slide. So again, when we talk about treatment with opiate use disorder, and I have just a, a few minutes left, um, the, the gold standard here is really behavioral treatments and counseling and skill-based acquisition, in addition to the medications that we have just been talking about. That really is what sets people up for the best possibility of success. Both of those medications that I talked about uh, provide what's called a neuroblockade, meaning they rest on the receptor sites of the brain that uh, would be activated if the person was using, say, a substance illicit. Uh, they both would be blocking those effects. And uh, both 
uh, reduce the potential for overdose, particularly for opioids, by 50% just by starting these medications. Okay, next slide. So how buprenorphine works is it, it, it's what's called a partial agonist, meaning unlike heroin, where you see it binds to the entire receptor site, it, it binds, but it doesn't fully activate it or turn it on. So there is not that, uh, that heavy uh, uh, sedating, reinforcing euphoria associated, right? That's the difference between, say, a heroin and norfin. Next slide. Um, it binds very, very tightly, and that's the blockade I was talking about, so that if a substance is introduced into the body, it's blocked from um, joining that receptor site. The fancy word for that is called affinity. Right? That's like a strong magnet. It's going to bind to that receptor very strongly so strongly that other similar substances will not displace it. Next slide. And really importantly here, what we found when we looked at uh, those in treatment for opiate use disorder without medications compared to those who were on medications like buprenorphine or Suboxone, uh, what we find is that uh, all of the patients without medication dropped out of treatment within 50 days, and 75% um, of the patients on the medications as a part of their treatment stayed in treatment for a year, right? And so that's a night and day outcome. And most importantly, 20% of the group that was randomized to not receive medication as a part of their treatment, in fact, died, right? So you can't do this study again because you can't randomize 20% of your sample to die, uh, right? And let's, again, dispel this mythology that the use of medications as a part of substance use disorder treatment is a bad thing. It's not. It's, in fact, saving lives. Next slide. So if we put this all together, uh, buprenorphine binds very tightly, occupies those receptors for a very long time, does not fully activate it, uh, and it has a ceiling effect, meaning at uh, a certain dosage, 32 milligrams, the person does not experience further effect from the medication, right, making it a much safer alternative. Because of this, when buprenorphine is on board, it blunts the effects of opioids, and it is relatively safe uh, at blocking an overdose, okay? That's amazing, and not something, not a tool that we have traditionally had in our toolbox in the world of treatment. We've had this one since 2002, and we're still talking about whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing. And so here we are, 2023, trying to continue to dispel the mythology and stigma about these treatments. Next slide. So let's look at stigma reduction in a peer setting, and I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Susie. Hello. Thank you, Eric. That was great. Um, yeah, I'm Susie McKenna. I'm the recovery coach for the recovery center at York Hospital. And I also uh, work at PRCC here in Portland, which is where I'm from. Uh, I do identify as someone in recovery. And if you could just move on to the next slide, that would be so great. I only have one slide. Uh, and what I'm here to talk about really is reducing stigma as a peer within the peer model of recovery. So we're talking a lot about reducing stigma in the community and people's perception of medicated assisted treatment. And we have these same problems within the recovery community of stigma and shaming. And it's really just old, you know, old information carrying over to this new, you know, much more successful model. So the, the recovery lens that you work as with as a peer is very similar. You're going to continue to work towards normalizing the issue of substance use disorder in multiple pathways within your workplace or within your community or within your recovery community. Uh, and multiple pathways is a real key to this. There is no magic formula. You know, if there were, I think everyone would be in recovery if it were that simple, uh, but it's not. And so we also have all kinds of cool resources and methods that go along with things like MAT. And it's my personal belief that most people need a combination of a lot of these things. And it's really just figuring out what is going to work for you. And if you don't know what's out there, if people don't know what's out there, how can they kind of 
come to understand it. So we really do have all kinds of cool support groups and, and multiple pathways. So that's my, my second bullet there is to educate yourself on the multiple pathways available um, and just share what you learn within your organization and your community and your recovery community. Uh, identify, this one is key as the peer, uh, peer model and reducing stigma uh, within the peer model is to identify any bias, personal or organizational. And it, I sort of thought, like, I don't have any bias. You know, I, I'm like for everything. But then I, I realized that I do. And it's simple of the, you know, something that uh, didn't work for me, such as methadone, uh, compared to something that did work for me, Suboxone, you know, I, I have bias. And I wasn't fully accepting the methadone path in the same way I wanted people to accept, you know, my chosen path. So it was really important to me to sort of understand that, and not let that interfere uh, with my, my approach as a recovery coach. So part of that is educating, like I said before, on the different pathways and having an understanding and then understanding where you, where your personal beliefs fit within that. You know, when something works for you, it's easy to get excited and want that to work for everyone, you know, and, and that's an option, but it's really very different for everyone. Everybody's choices are going to be a little bit different. Uh, so again, language is so key. Be mindful of using the language. I used to think like, well, if I'm, if I want to say I'm an addict, I can say I'm an addict, but I really, you know, was doing har unnecessary harm to the community by kind of insisting on that. So it's not always easy to be the person that says like, look, maybe this, we could use a different word here, you know, or, and, and sometimes we need to do it, you know, with people on a clinical level who just are really, you know, new behavior, new language. Sometimes we just need to educate people in, in a kind, gentle way. Uh, old language can really be harmful. Uh, and so then last, again, be, be that voice within your community and within your recovery community. It, it's hard uh, within the community. There are some real, you know, people kind of take sides on the issue of MAT. And I feel like it's gotten a lot better in the last five years where, you know, the MAT people and the, and the 12 step people are a little more friendly, but there's still a lot of friction and there's still a lot of judgment. You know, people on MAT really judge abstinence and uh, abstinence people really judge MAT. And it's really so ridiculous. Yeah. You know, why, why would you want somebody to not recover if something is working for them? So really, you're, nobody would want that. Right. So that's that's why we just educate ourselves, keep being open to feedback. That's something that I'm not always great. You know, be open if somebody says, look, you know, I think maybe we could take a look at the language you're using, you know, be open to that. Sometimes it happens to me, you know, everybody uh, is still learning. This is all a process. So I think that's kind of it for me. I really do think uh, that there is a, a stigma problem within the recovery community, just as much as there is in the whole, uh, you know, larger community. So it's important uh, as, as a peer or as an affected other or an ally, to really educate yourself and sort of be part of the solution. I guess that's it for me. Hi, I'm Lacey Bailey. Thank you, Suzik, uh, Susie and Eric um, for both of your sharing. Um, I think this is a really important topic and I'm just going to briefly go over the signs and symptoms of an overdose and show you how to use Narcan so that you'll be equipped if you ever come across a situation. I, I hope nobody does, but um, with me losing two people a day, uh, the risk is definitely there. Uh, next slide. So signs and symptoms of an overdose. Um, an overdose occurs when a recommended or tolerated amount of a substance is consumed and it shuts down the central nervous system and ultimately stops breathing. Uh, signs of that can be bluing or purpling of the lips, uh, fingertips. Uh, breathing becomes or can become very slow. And when I say slow, it is noticeably slow, like something is not right here um, and or stops when somebody has completely stopped breathing. Uh, that very slow breathing can sometimes look like a gasping or gurgling or even kind of a snoring noise. Um, and of course, if somebody's unconscious, the limp body and uh, won't respond to yelling or touch. 
Next, please. So Narcan is an opioid antagonist. Uh, we heard Eric talk a little bit about how Suboxone is a partial antagonist, um, opioid, uh, an opioid antagonist. So Narcan actually goes to the receptors that the opioids are in and bind it to, and it kicks them all out um, for a period of time that the Narcan um, stays in the system. It will reverse the effects of that overdose or can um, and hopefully will. And uh, it does throw a person into uh, an instant kind of withdrawal because they're booting all those opioids out of the receptors. So the system is kind of like, hey, what's going on here? And you start coming across some of those other symptoms that could come up for somebody that's in withdrawal. Uh, it is a very important public health tool. Uh, I don't think, I think that kind of explains we've been losing um, thousands and thousands of lives across um, America each year. And uh, and I'm actually proud to report that I believe that the stigma around Narcan has far lessened than what it used to be. Just in my experience this year, the outreach, um, the request that I've been getting to come and train people, and it just uh, feels really good to see that out there and people kind of being ready to join the fight um, and being able to have a tool that can save a life if, if needed. Next, please. Uh, so steps to take, um, if you can't get an answer um, from that person, uh, please don't put them in cold water or shower. Uh, that is something that we've heard a lot. Um, it can actually increase risk of negative outcomes in that situation. Um, and, you know, call 911. Uh, an overdose is absolutely a medical emergency um, and Narcan can do so much, but EMS and all of that can do a little bit more. So it's very important that we have um, medical personnel on the way um, first. Next, please. And so I have Narcan with me here today. So this is just a little diagram on how to use. Um, this is actually, is it the right way up this way? There we go. Yeah, no, this way. Um, this is Narcan. There's two doses in every box. And the dose looks just like it does in the picture here. Just a little pink plunger here in the middle. And as easy as this looks is as easy as it is to use, which is what is so great about it. Um, you would obviously open this up, put it into the nostril, and completely uh, press that plunger. Um, and it can take up to three minutes for Narcan to work. And um, often it can work quicker than that, but it can take up to three minutes. So we say that uh, just because you don't have to sit there and continue to use Narcan. Um, if you can, you know, keep a timer, a watch, check your phone. Uh, you'll most likely have EMS 911 on the phone who will also be walking through, through these steps, um, but it is that easy to use. Next slide, please. Uh, so storage of Narcan, keep at room temperature. If it freezes, allow it to thaw out before you use. Uh, we do suggest that if, if you do have Narcan and is expired, please keep it because having expired Narcan is better than none. Uh, if you need more, you can reach out to me. Uh, you can find me on the options or knowyouroptions.main website and I administer uh, Narcan for free to anybody in the community, businesses, individuals, and can I also come out to different entities and do Narcan training as well. Uh, we have a lot of places that are keeping it stored with their first aid and AEDs. Um, and a question that I do get a lot out there just um, that I want to address is it is safe uh, for use, uh, even if it is another medical emergency. So say somebody's having a heart attack or a stroke or something like that, um, Narcan will not negatively um, affect them. And that's just a question I get often. So next slide. Or is that it for me? Oh, the Good Samaritan law. So this is a protection um, that Maine offers. Other states have similar laws. Um, but this is protection for the person who is seeking or assisting in the overdose and the person that is overdosing. So uh, if law enforcement and other people come on scene, that person is not going to be arrested. The person who called is not going to be trouble. And that protection is there to uh, encourage people to seek help uh, so that they don't have that fear of, of getting in trouble for being involved. Um, and this law offers quite a few protections. Uh, if you look it up, it'll give you a, a full list of what those protections are for a person involved in an overdose. And next. 
And I think that's it. And again, like I said, if anybody out there uh, needs additional Narcan training to come to an entity, please feel free to reach out. And thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Lacey. And I think that we are going to launch that second set of polling questions right now. We're going to give you a minute to finish those, and then we are going to um, have some Q&A. So if you could take a minute now and just answer these questions, that would be terrific. Ten more seconds, and then we will go ahead and show you the results from that first poll and the second poll. Okay, so these are the results from the first survey. And I think that we'd have to scroll down to kind of see the, the full results. And then we will share the results of the second survey with you and we will go ahead then and take questions. If you do have questions, please type them into the Q&A button on the bottom of the Zoom screen. And we will get to those questions in just a minute. Okay, we're having some technical difficulties with the polling questions, showing them side by side. So I think that we're going to go ahead right now and just um, ask the questions. Uh, if anybody has anything, please type them in. Otherwise, we did receive a couple of questions um, before the webinar from people when they registered. Um, and one of those questions, it's probably for you, Eric, but um, is there any one substance that's considered to be the most addictive substance or is it just personal preferences? Um, I think that that tends to revolve mostly around personal preferences, why we call it a substance of choice. Um, nicotine always tops the list. Okay, thank you. And then this question, it might be back to you, Eric, if Sally's not on, but um, is there any evidence that shows if a person avoids using any substances until after college or 20 plus years of age, is there any less likelihood of developing addictive behavior? Um, there's absolutely uh, research in fact behind that. Um, the age of onset is a strong predictor of acquiring a substance use disorder. Um, the earlier a person begins using, the more likely in adulthood they will have not just a problem, but a lifelong problem. Okay, thank you. And then the last question I have here um, is probably back to you, Eric, but uh, does insurance cover the cost of recovery coaching? And how does someone become a recovery coach? Um, I'm actually going to turf that to Susie. My apologies. I have a one o'clock Zoom uh, at my mm. child's in inboarding soon to be college. <laughs> so I'm going to have to jump off of this and on. Yeah, you better get on there. And I will leave this to you, Susie. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, there, um, at, at being a recovery coach is relatively uh easy. There is a training, a four or five day training. I'm one of the trainers. Um, and it is a really incredible peer approach that you know, I had just finished my master's when coaching came onto the scene. And I, you know, I am grateful for my master's and I use it all the time, but really my, my recovery coach training and my training as a trainer for that is what drives most of my work as a, as a coach and a peer. Um, and yes, there are insurances that reimburse for coaching. Thank you, Susie. Mm -hmm. 
And so we do have um, another question that that came in. Um, hmm. I did not hear much about family and need to educate and treat the effects of disease. Mm. How do you use self-help as an additional tool and can be a lifelong support? So I think we have you and Lacey mm. on the line. Would either mm. of you like to take that question? Yeah, you know, a family, what sometimes we refer to as affected others, um, are, 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 are very much affected and, and have a huge impact on, on uh, a, a person's potential for success. It is not a driving uh, impact, but it is, of course, important to support family members. There are groups for family members, Al-Anon, Naranon, uh, and there are also many more support groups than, than there used to be in that, in that regard. So I'm sure there are support group uh, versions of all of the, the meetings. I think there are options for affected others. Lacey, you might be able yeah, to Yeah, I just wanted to add to, um, there, there are some options. The Family Restored has been a really great option um, for affected others. Honestly, I don't think we do enough for affected others. Mm -hmm. And I only say that because over the year of being in this position, mm -hmm. I find myself often working with parents or affected others until mm -hmm. the person with the substance use disorder is ready to have the conversation. And mm -hmm. I just think it's been instrumental in supporting them to support their loved one. Um, and, uh, and I would also say, you know, if it's not, you know, just not based around, but just your own mental health is, mm -hmm. is to take care of is very important. So even if you're seeking some counseling on your own, and some of that is because you're an affected other, I would encourage that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your help answering that last question. Um, and we would just like to remind anybody who's still with us on the line that if you would like to receive Narcan from the York mm -hmm. Hospital Recovery Center, um, you just send your mailing address to info at yourcospital.com, and we will get that out to you either this week or next. Um, thank you to all of our presenters, and thank you for everyone who tuned in today. Um, and you can look forward to receiving that link of the recorded webinar sometime next week. Thank you very much.